dialogue and we will be talking to he will be talking to us about gaming technology for future transport um Krista will speak for about 30 35 minutes and after which we will open the floor up for discussion but during the talk if you wish to ask questions you can use the raise hand feature or post your question in the q a feature of uh, with zoom um so before we begin i just want to say that if you wish to watch our upcoming seminars and um uh, you want to see our previous seminars, please sign up on our website. And uh, now, Krista, I give you the floor. It's all yours. Oh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm very happy to do this uh, presentation here. And I, I will go through with you uh, what we work with at For Dialogue and the reasons behind it. So, so hang on a second. I'll click Continue there. And I assume I need to share my screen now. Just a second, see if I can find that. There it is. Um, let's see here. Um, why doesn't it start? Share screen. There it is. OK. I just want to make sure everyone sees what I've done here. So can you see my screen? Yes, looking good. OK, thank you. So um, the, the rationale behind uh, what I've been doing for the last 20 years is that we, um, um, I realized that since a couple of friends of mine passed away in car accidents in early 2000, uh, that we definitely need uh, to look into better ways of, of getting around in the world. Um, and uh, after looking into what kind of systems that are available, I realized that uh, most of the good ideas already are all already out there. And so um, I started with forming um, a think tank in 2001. It's called the INIST. Uh, and uh, what we did, we interviewed people for almost four years uh, from all angles of industry. And we decided very early that we needed to have a group of people who were not afraid of thinking out of the box and, and really uh, had no issue with, with uh, other people calling them uh, you know, crazy or anything like that. It's very important to deal with people and may have new ideas, especially when it's on a global scale, that uh, you're, you should not be afraid of, of thinking um, big and thinking different. So the first, in from between 2001 and 2005, uh, we had a group of people with the quality manager from IKEA, uh, the vice president of a large Swedish um, insurance company, KPA, um, the secretary of the Green Party, uh, and the general manager of the Swedish defense industry, um, um, and uh, uh, a few other people, um, Emin Tengström, researcher from, from uh, Göteborg Chalmers, who was at that stage uh, in the Volvo Research uh, Foundation. Anyway, so, so we discussed different kind of ideas and we came to a very simple conclusion. Yes, the, the, the concept of having a better transportation system is, is very good and it is something we really need to do. Uh, now, one of the questions we ask ourselves, and this is really important, um, because there's a huge difference between incremental change and, 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 and um, paradigm change. Um, and the big difference is that incremental change is using existing technologies and, and improving them slightly. And that is what's happening right now with self-driving cars, self-driving small vehicles, etc. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's something we should definitely continue to do. Um, however, our focus was more into more radical change of transportation. What kind of systems out there uh, could be implemented? And, and are there any existing today? And what are the plans for the future? So uh, we came to the conclusion in 2005 that the world needs to understand better ways of transportation. And we need to start communicating that question and, and getting people involved. One of the outcomes of this was that we needed to visualize. So, because how can you talk about something in the future if you don't know how it's going to look like in, and, and you can't plan, plan for it? And so, uh, eventually, this is actually much later than 2005, 
we came up with the concept of visualizing connectivity and using a, a concept called, we, we call it game plan, game plan 4D. Now it's, this becomes easily very theoretical. So it's important to see what exactly it is. So we've done a couple of, uh, we've done many different projects, but these are two of the recent ones. One is the Atlanta airport, it just finished about a month ago or two months ago. And uh, we did a concept for the Ericsson Mobility Day. So I'm gonna show you very slowly uh, here, let's see here. Now there's sound in this, I think I'm gonna switch it off. I don't know, can you hear the sound? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll turn it down. I don't want it to be too. So Atlanta Airport is one of the biggest airports in the world. It's actually the biggest. And they wanted to look into how a, a guide um, separated system would look like using autonomous solar powered vehicles up to six passengers each. And we were giving the task of visualizing this for the airport integrating it with several stations, integrating it with the ticketing system, integrating it with the, basically everything that's there on the airport and outside the airport. Now, there actually exists another technology, uh, several of them. One is at the Heathrow airport, it's called the Ultra system. And you can see here how it looks like. We integrated it into this film for, for the Atlanta audience. Maybe uh, maybe a few of you have seen the system or been there even. So uh, we did this uh, video and, and it's a communication video because all we do is actually about communication and getting stakeholders involved in understanding what is it, what you want to do. We do some basic financial um, numbers. We crunch a couple of numbers regarding capacity, speed, energy use, etc. However, most of the things we do um, tend to be uh, basic information for more heavy hitters consultants to, to crunch on and work on later. This is the Porsche uh, station. Uh, Porsche United States has its headquarters in Atlanta just by the airport and Delta um, Airways has its headquarters there also. So we made a station there. Now I'm, I'm not gonna go through this, uh, the entire movie. Now, uh, what we also did last year in June 12th, uh, 2019 was to show uh, the concept of mobility using VR technology. And this is it. So this is actually not, it, it looks exactly like the square we were at, but it's actually a VR setting. So what you see here is, is a, a synthesis of, of uh, uh, data using exactly the same location. And you can see different kinds. This is the Ein Ride bus and other things. Now this was more for marketing purposes and showing the technology itself, how it works. And this is what you can see inside the VR. Oh, I'm gonna slow down the, the, the sound, sorry. So inside the VR technology, you can actually show uh, presentations, videos, and, and the cars, and you can experience how would we like to be in a setting with uh, autonomous vehicles. I'm gonna stop this too. There. So let's get back to this. So what we had, these are two examples of people wanting to see and communicating the future of transportation. Now, where do we come from? Uh, this tool has been developed in collaboration with the Citra in the United States, UC Irvine, and we've been quite heavily involved with the, uh, the Yavle Innovation Arena project in Yavle for the last four years. We're not in Yavle anymore uh, that much, but uh, that was a big part of our work for the last years. Uh, I, I strongly recommend you to go to Yavle Innovation Arena, or GIA as we call it, and, and have a look. Um, I assume, Bavana and Roger, that you will send out a PDF that I provided. Is that correct? Yes, we can send it to all the participants afterwards. Good. But then you will be able to see what this is. And we also, before that, we worked uh, in a project called Green IoT with Uppsala University, Ericsson, City of Uppsala, and some other providers. So we can actually use sensors inside the software because it's a gaming software. 
so you can see what's going on in real life, but you synthesize it so we can see it in the virtual world also at the same time. It's also good to have a sensor for different kinds of pollution or other things you need to look at. And uh, what we did uh, for this um, work in, in uh, uh, at Ericsson at the Mobility Day, that was done in collaboration with the project we done earlier with ITRL, where you are right now, Bavana and Roger. And uh, so we can actually connect to, to the cloud data through 5G. And um, we are now also part of Dry Sweden. So what's the point of all this? The idea is to visualize connectivity, is to visualize the future, to understand what, what uh, how, how, how are things going to change? What opportunities what do we have? What obstacles do we have? And, and on so many levels, it's, all, it's not only visual, it's also about energy, it's about capacity, it's about many, many different things. And it, it's okay, it says there are plenty of tools to do this, not using visual tools, using Excel spreadsheets, databases, uh, big data, etc. But uh, in order to understand and have many different stakeholders, regardless where you come from, you maybe you're a business owner in an area you want to put in a system, um, you're a researcher, you are a um, city official, there's so many different angles to this. It's important that everybody can see the same thing and, and join in one room or, or on Zoom like this and, and see what is the future, how should it look like, what kind of changes do we need to do and what impact does it have? So it's a communication technology. It's a basically a software game. Um, so we use to, to visualize how an urban setting would change using autonomous vehicles. Uh, and we can add sensors to the actual real data and live data streams. And we can even put in geofencing. That is, uh, we can set off different kinds of virtual crossings, et cetera, using street, street lights or whatever you want to do. Uh, it's also monitoring cap capability, because as you do this simulation, uh, you, can, um, you, you have different options for planning, because you, what you can do is, is first you use it as it's a real tool uh, to plan for one basic scenario, but then you can do alternatives, and not only alternatives, you can also have the real-time data for what you actually did to be monitored within the system. See here. This is a slide I got from Ericsson, and I just wanted to put in where we fit into this. Uh, um, so it's a way to, to using sensors, smart vehicles. We're using geofencing, it's artificial intelligence through our simulations. And we use extensive use of map data. That's actually why we were in Gävle for some time because of Lantmeteriet and all the um, GIS companies established there so we could actually go through both sensor data and GIS data in real time. So you might ask yourself why this is important. Well, um, I think uh, this is something that's been an important topic for me for the last 20 years. So we really need to have a substantially better way of moving around. Um, autonomous vehicles on separated guideways are really cool things because they're capable of creating a much better system. Um, they're safer, faster, cheaper, and definitely way more sustainable. And our idea is to have a software for that and we call it game plan or game plan 4D. Now, how do we reach out? Because it's such a huge task to get people involved in this and, and it's very difficult to change the way people work today, especially those who are established in, 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 in this industry. So we, we reach out to students and we reach out to people who are, who are able to think differently. And one of the main things we're doing is, let's see here if I can find that. Uh -huh. One of the main things we do is the, uh, a student project we call the Urban International Design Contest. And we have now over 30 um, uh, teams that has been involved for the last years doing, uh, they go to their city and we help them with that. Uh, they find a sponsor. And what they do is put together a proposal for their city or their urban area. And it's been quite successful. We had, um, uh, teams, uh, Swedish teams, of course, KTH was one of them a couple of years ago. 
uh, Yavl, of course, but also in the United States with um, uh, Princeton University. Uh, in, we have worked with Washington, D.C., uh, with Perth, Australia, um, what else? Uh, Kampala, Uganda, and many other places. I'm just going to browse through this. Um, so the first play winner this year was uh, from the last year competition was the Battle Creek team uh, from Western Michigan University. Uh, and uh, the second place was from Kampala. Uh, and third place was Southern Illinois University. And the year before I should mention was actually Katie Age that was the winner uh, from, from 2018. Uh, this is judge. We have a couple of judges. So Ena Tuvison, who is a strategist at Swedish Transportation Administration. Gerald Posky is quite a, a well-known profile in Silicon Valley. He's a project manager for transportation planning. You probably heard of all these buses that, that they're using at Google. And he is also very well. Uh, uh, he knows a lot about uh, this new technology and something he's been involved in before he joined Google. And Claude Scala, he's a French uh, industrialist, and he's uh, creating a company doing exactly this right now, uh, autonomous vehicles on, on its own guideway. Now, I'm going to take a short break, uh, Bavana and Roger, and maybe there are questions now. So uh, uh, before I continue. OK, so if anybody would like to ask questions, you can use the raise hand feature, which you'll find in the, um, in the participant uh, section or you can write in the question and answer session uh, section. Okay, Krista, we don't have any questions at the moment, but okay. oh, sorry, no, we do just got one coming. Okay. Um, so um, have the ideas of platforms from the contest actually been adopted by um, a city in some way? Um, kind of, yeah. I, I wouldn't say that, that they've been taken exactly as the students proposed it, but that's never going to happen, I think, because the city planners and all the other uh, people involved in the process definitely going to have a word. But I do know for Sundberg, who was the first place in 2017, uh, that was presented at City Hall for, um, uh, for all the um, executives at, at the city, and they are working on a proposal. Um, I also know that the, the team that won this year uh, in uh, Battle Creek, uh, they are actually planning to do that system. Um, the system in Washington, D.C. was done, um, but not the way the students designed it. They, they choose the same technology, but they decided to use it in a different place. Uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, Jacksonville, um, the, who came second years ago, they um, used the, the student proposal uh, for, for planning for the next phase. And actually, the students who work with it, they got uh, employed by the city doing exactly this. So they used the experience from the, uh, from the study and from the UIDC project to participate and, and actually be employed in the project. So yeah, kind of. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have uh, another question here from Kyoso, which is, um, is the demand for the transport concepts uh, slash designs also modeled or simulated? No, um, that is a very good question. And that is something we're working on right now. Uh, we just started a new concept. It's not finalized yet. Uh, just as we have Drive Sweden, uh, we have a new concept we call Ride Silicon Valley. Um, what it is, it's a, it's, a, it's a setup a little similar to Drive Sweden, but only for Silicon Valley or companies related there. You can be a company anywhere in the world, but you need to have some kind of presence in Silicon Valley. And the first team that just joined is from the University of San Jose, uh, San Jose State University. And, and they put into their proposal with the city uh, to do exactly that, to do um, uh, some kind of modeling or demand uh, modeling inside this, the project. It's a one year project. It will be finished in May 2021. And I really look forward to see what they're going to do. They're going to use our software and our technology as just one part of many parts of this visualization and demand modeling. Great, thank you. Um, and um, one more uh, additional question from Gio today is, uh, do you plan to provide interfaces for demand? Excuse me, I, I didn't understand the do, question. Uh, 
do you have plans to provide interfaces in the software for demand? No, not right now, because uh, I think demand modeling is quite difficult to visualize. What we can visualize is the results from those. So if you have results from demand modeling, uh, we, what we can do is actually put in those demands and, and visualize uh, crowds of people going into stations and see if we can handle them. So, so what we can do is, is verifying that the demand and the system design, the capacity of the system uh, will actually fit. Um, however, we have no intention of putting demand modeling technology into our software. Uh, we think there are better systems out there that can do that. Podaris, for example, and many others, Beamways. So, so we, we suggest you use them instead. We all, I to say, I, we interface with those systems. Hmm. Great, thank you. That's all of the questions for, for now. I think we can. Okay. Now, I don't know this audience how well versed you are with the history and these kinds of technology. I, I, I decided I'd like to show you um, um, what we actually, what's out there. Just a second. So this is a video uh, from an English guy. I think I should do full screen here. And um, I'm, I'm just gonna, hopefully you can hear the sound. Tell me if you can't. It is one of the personal rapid transit pods at London's Heathrow Airport. It will take you from one of the car parks to Terminal 5, and from Terminal 5 to one of the car parks, and that's about it. When it was installed in 2011, oh, this was going to be the future of transport, but it hasn't really worked out that way. And more than that, they got beaten to the punch by 35 years. Because in 1975, West Virginia University opened this, their own personal rapid transit system. The pods here in the city of Morgantown might not be quite as sleek and rounded, but there's 70 of them. They carry more people, and they go to five stations along an eight-mile track. This really is personal transit. You push a button, and a car arrives to take you where you want to go, non-stop. At peak times, there'll be a car along every few minutes for each separate destination. PRT never shuts down. We have run 40 years without any major incident. 10 inches of snow, and we'll be fine. Um, that's because we have a heated track here. Kids don't like it because we keep the school open. There are no variables. If I'm going from point A to point B, if it's eight minutes, it is eight minutes. Back in the 1970s, the only option for getting students between all the separate university campuses here was a fleet of buses. But Morgantown is a city with steep hills and narrow roads, so the result was gridlock. And at the time, American politicians were actually having a bit of a craze for systems like this. Richard Nixon announced that there was development money available, and uh, West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd, who was famous in part for just how much money he managed to bring back to his own state, he managed to get Morgantown selected as the testing site. The Boeing Company and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory were involved with getting the system to work. The system right now can carry well over uh, 4,000 passengers an hour. Every vehicle when it departs a station has a route. Every time an assigned vehicle moves over a presence detector, that location is monitored by the station electronics, which then conveys that message back to central control room. And then that message is depicted by the mimic board in central control. And each one of those blinking lights represents a presence detector that also represents five seconds in travel time. In the train world, uh, all the switching is done on the track. So the track physically moves to orient a vehicle down a different pathway on a different rail line. In our system, the vehicle switches on board. The result of Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop there. So um, uh, why this is important, I, I can give a couple of personal reflections on this, uh, and especially even more so in, in these COVID times and, and when we have this social distancing. Uh, the need for a new transportation is really urgent and, and we need to find something smarter and better to get around. Um, I, I really appreciate what's going on with self-driving cars, new, new uh, battery technology with electrification, um, uh, minibuses and all this automation is really good things. However, uh, what we really need to focus on also is, is to look into the major uh, change in and transform uh, in, into new technology that can be used on a large scale in the world. Um, just, just to be clear, a couple of ideas that, that are floating around high-speed rail, for example, in Sweden and many other places, 
the good thing about high-speed rail, it gets people from A to B if they live very close to A and very close to B pretty fast. However, the problem is that most people don't live close to A or B, or at least maybe in one of those places, but not the other one. So the average speeds from A to B where they are and where they want to go is still pretty slow because the change of mode when they arrive or they get to the, their destination or where the, the departure is, is um, slowing them down. And this new technology with having autonomous vehicles that can go on a separate guideway uh, with relatively high speed is actually a much more efficient way of getting around for everyone and much more democratic because it doesn't matter where you live as long as you have a pretty uh, station pretty near to your to where you live or where you want to go. So, so this technology is really important for us and, and the great things, uh, one, another great thing about it is personal, there's no timetables and they go really fast where you want to go using just solar and wind and, and um, hydro energy for that. Uh, so this tool we're developing is, is for how can we do this world. We give it to students, we work together with universities, we work with cities all over the world and, and uh, see how we can uh, exploit this idea of doing something radical change in transportation using virtual technology for, for uh, young people especially, who will be, because that's the, the people who are going to need it for the future. That's kind of my end comment. And um, I give back to you, Bavana and Roger, to, to continue. OK, so what we <clears throat> usually do now is open up the floor um, for more questions and, um, and discussions. So once again, if uh, people would like to raise, raise their hands in the uh, participant section or write questions in the question and answer section, then I can um, I can read those out to you, um, or I can uh, allow people to, to talk if they would like to discuss uh, any points with you in finer detail. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so please feel free, everybody um, in the audience to um, raise your hand if you uh, have a question you'd like to ask. No, we have nothing from the audience right now, Krista. Is there is there anything else that you would like to like to add, like to discuss? Well, I just want to point out that uh, anyone who are at university or in any way interested in this, uh, we are making available this technology for for students. Uh, we are working on different projects right now. Uh, quite a few of them in the United States. The only problem is that everything is on hold right now because of this stupid uh, virus thing. But uh, um, uh, I ex expect things to get better soon. So um, anyone who wants to participate in this and, and work with cities, work with planners and, and companies into planning for the future using this technology, you're very welcome to contact us. Okay, we, um, we have one question um, from uh, Eric. Okay. And uh, he says that he's a bit worried that sometimes we try to en engineer our way to solutions when yeah, we social have, engineering is that uh, what you mean? Uh, no no um i think he means um uh, physical uh, the, the technological solutions um when what we actually need is new policy um uh, eg reduction in car traffic or better public transport what's your take on that well this is public transport so i totally agree uh, engineering is a good thing it doesn't always work but that's another issue but the conceptual part of this um is that um uh, you know, the best, the best reduction of, of uh, carbon emission for travel is not to, to travel at all. Uh, everybody knows that, and that's very evident right now. H however, uh, we do need to get around. And, and if we're going to get around, a, a shared system is way better than a private system. And that's policy. Yet that's also public transportation. This is, this is all what I'm talking about. It's all public. There's no private part at all, at all around this. And, and uh, you have to be aware of that using the private car today, 95% of the time, the private car does, it doesn't move. It's just sitting somewhere. It's, it's like litter. 
just sitting somewhere doing nothing. As soon as you, uh, as soon as you uh, share uh, vehicles, the, the system changes. And, and uh, um, right now we have the production of, I think it's about 150, 20 million cars a year or something like that. And as soon as, soon as people start sharing, uh, the, the reduction is dramatic. Um, you only need, um, there are about 40 major car, car production facilities in the world today. And uh, if everybody starts sharing, you only need four or five of them. The rest you can just lock down. And, and of course, there's a financial interest in, for us not to do that. And that's also one of the reasons that the, this new technology with self-driving cars, etc., is pushed so hard because it's just uh, um, putting us even more into this sprawl and, and the world where we're all using a private vehicle that's almost never used, even if it's electric, it doesn't matter. I'm not against cars, I use a car myself, but I think they should be heavily reduced in how much you use them. And this is a public system and it's all about policy. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question came from Gyoso, but I'm, I'm thinking rather than me reading it, I could perhaps uh, turn on Gyoso's mic and allow him okay, to ask please, the question go ahead. if he would like to. So Gyoso, I'm going to put your mic um, live now. And if you would like to ask your question live, we can do that. Yeah, sure. So hi. Um, hi. So the question is relating to uh, how detailed are the simulations of the movements of these objects or vehicles and how scalable is this simulation? Well, it is also, it's of course, a question of, of how you're going to use it. Right now, it's a live stream of data, and that limits the surface. In Atlanta, it's approximately 8 to 10 square kilometers. Out of those, let's say 10 square kilometers, out of those 10, uh, we are using maybe, I, I would say, 4 or 5 gigabyte of data. So it, it takes a really good computer to run the simulation. You have to have a gaming laptop or gaming computer, basically. Um, so it's a question of so many variables. It's hard to answer that question. So scale, yes, you can scale it much bigger, but then you need supercomputers eventually if you want to do in a city like Stockholm and even New York. Uh, if you want to put in all the buildings, all the streets and all the traffic, uh, I think it's almost undoable with, with, our, with our technology, with the huge uh, uh, visualization if you want to have high detail. So it's a question of how much detail do we want uh, in, in, in the simulation of bu buildings, streets, trees or whatever. That's variable number one. Number two is how, how many vehicles are going to use and are you going to do, use different modes? Are you going to use cars, pods, bikes, people walking or whatever? So it, it, it's a mix of a lot of data and how much data you want to put in and what kind of computer you have or computers to actually visualize it. So it's a little hard to, to give you a straight answer, but I would say on, on the average gaming laptop, a couple of square kilometers with quite a high detail and maybe four to 500 movements, that's doable. Mm. Okay. Um, another one was, uh, can you do like user-centered simulations? So you were, so the viewpoint is, is sort of the, uh, the user. Is that something that- you that's, that's how we do it. Okay. Mm. Mm. All right, thanks. Mm. Okay. Great, thank you, Kyoso. Um, Okay, so we have um, another question here in the in the Q and A. So I'll read that out. But um, don't forget as well that you can raise your hand, and I can um, I can allow you to to ask the question live if you would prefer. So that's also an option for everybody. Um, so I'll read out um, Stan's um, question, which is: What role is gamification playing in understanding this paradigm change um, and safety slash security questions related to it? Well, it relates to the question I just got to the first person perspective, because you can walk into the station live using your keyboard or VR set or whatever, and you go into the car and sit down and you experience the ride. And we can put in uh, people coming into the vehicle of different kinds. You know, it, it could be someone coming in with luggage from an airport or, or it could be a, a gang of, of young people just partying, coming in late at night, or or you can actually, we can visualize and simulate that you have the option to require a personal vehicle temporarily because you don't, you, you, you're at late at night, there's no rush hours, you can actually have your own ride at that time. So, so there's so many things you can do to simulate this first person experience in, in the game, just like any computer game. 
So, so uh, that's why we use it for that purpose. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if, if Stan uh, feels like asking a follow-up question or maybe yeah. he can uh, raise his hand if he, he would like to, uh, to extend, uh, expand on that. Okay, um, okay. for now uh, we, can, um, we can ask Claudia's question. Um, and that is, um, what do you think would be the main reason um, to induce people to change their behavior from owning private vehicles to sharing? Okay, now we're talking philosophy here. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so in order to make that happen, I have a very strong feeling about that it has to be better. That there's only one way we can get Peter out of the personal car. And that is find a way to get them from A to B, wherever A is, wherever B is, where they don't need to think about parking, maintenance, anything of that. They feel safe. They feel that they're getting wherever they want to go faster, simpler, and it's a less waste of time steering that, uh, using that steering wheel or whatever they want to do. So, and, and not having that huge capital investment. So if they can go wherever you want to go for five bucks within a reasonable area, let's say the Stockholm County area or something like that. If they can do that for five bucks and it beats everything else, including the car, then we have a chance. If not, it's not gonna work. Okay, great. Um... I don't think there are any more questions for now. Bhavna, would you like to um, would you like to come in? Yes, let me just quickly. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Krista, for joining us today. It was really interesting, and I'm guessing. The, based on the questions, the discussion was, um, and the discussion was pretty re really good and something sparked in all of us, I guess. So that's really interesting. Um, so uh, before leaving for all of you, I just want to say that uh, for our previous seminars and the upcoming seminars, please uh, log into our website and join us and register yourself so we can see you on the next one. So yeah, thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Christoph. Yeah. Thank you.